This is Dr. Roger Green in his Church History course, Reformation to the Present. This is session number 12 on Pietism in Germany and America. Okay, we are going to journey on here. I'm on page 13 of the syllabus, and, um, and you can see the title of the lecture is Lecture 6, Evangelical Resurgence in the Church. So, <clears throat> first of all, just a word about this, and then I've got a pretty long, a, a introduction is actually a pretty long introduction, so, but just a word about this evangelical resurgence in the church. Um, what you often see in church history, church history is kind of like a pendulum in a sense. It just swings back and forth. And we have seen the pendulum swing in one direction uh, with our last lecture. And um, some pretty severe, when we talked about theology of the age of the Enlightenment, uh, some pretty severe criticism of Christianity, of the church, of the teachings of the Bible, and so forth. Um, even radical criticism that says Jesus never even existed. You know, the Gospels weren't written in 200 AD. They made up Jesus as kind of your ideal person, your, your, your ideal man to follow, and so forth. So criticism got pretty radical, and Christianity really came under fire. So, um, so now, what's happened now, however, is that the pendulum swings again, back with this evangelical resurgence, kind of this is renewal movements within the church, bringing the church back to its first love and so forth. So you see this pendulum swinging back and forth in the course. Um, the issue here is still, in a sense, the issue of the nature of the church and of the community of believers. So there's a sense in which in this lecture it, it, it is still ecclesi ecclesiology which is driving things. Um, but uh, we're going to see a great kind of the church kind of coming to life in a sense. So we want to just take note of that. So Now, with this introduction, there are a few kind of things I'd like to say by way of introduction. So. Um, First, of, first thing I'd like to say is that it seems pretty standard that movements of the spirit in the church will eventually die down. Uh, the great movements of the spirit, uh, the great revivals in the church, the great kind of bringing the church to life will eventually kind of settle down. And, they, and we've seen that, again, we've seen that in the la last lecture, they lose their vitality. Um, they can lose their vitality by kind of almost an inertia which comes into the life of the church, um, a lack of movement in the life of the church, a lack of forward thinking in the life of the church, or, so, or they, can come, uh, they can settle down by way of suffocation, people kind of suffocating the church. By, um, so so this, this, the, this settling down can either come from within or it can come from without, or it can come from both places. But nevertheless, you do see this kind of this settling down that often takes place here, and then you get into a cycle of, of decay in the church, and that becomes kind of bad news. So, And we have seen that happen in various places. So just remind ourselves of the four places where we've seen that happen. First of all, Germany. Um, what happened with Germany, as we mentioned, was the spontaneity, the, um, the imagination, the creativity of Martin Luther did settle down, second and third, fourth generation. And it settled down into kind of a rationalism, a German rationalism. So we saw that happening with Germany. And um, what was more important were dogmas rather than the Christian life. And a lot of people knew all the dogmas of the church, but they had no sense of, the, of Christian living and of the Christian life and no kind of joy in the Christian experience. So, so we saw that ha happen in Germany. What we saw happening in England, just to remind ourselves, God bless you, was kind of a, a reasonable religion settled into English life, a deism settled into English life. And we saw that that happened in a sense the head was moved, but the heart was unmoved. Uh, again, uh, there was kind of a rationalism, uh, kind of a scholasticism in a sense, uh, but there was no movement of the spirit in the heart of people, in the hearts of people, and the lives of people, and so forth. So we saw it happen in, in, in England. We've seen it happen in, in America, of course, and we gave that lecture the other day about America, and we didn't ask everybody to agree with that. Um, 
think about it, what did happen in, in America. Certainly, the one thing we can agree on is that the Puritanism that we saw earlier in America, that settled down into kind of a suffocating life. Um, where the early Puritans came here with a lot of creativity, a lot of imagination. Uh, they were biblically based. Um, they were very interested in establishing um, places where God would be honored and so forth. Puritanism settled down, second, third, fourth generation. So those, that, those later generations settled down into a very kind of a cycle of decay where um, earning things meant more uh, to them than... Uh, than a, a, a life of the heart and a life of the mind for Christ and the kingdom and so forth. So we saw that. I, I tried to make the case that also you see that with the founding fathers, with a settling, with deism kind of settling in to American life. But certainly there was that settling down. In France, there was really kind of a, what uh, Mark No calls a de-Christianization took place in France. So France um, really, here, and I'm going to quote here from Mark No. Here's what Mark No said. The turning point in the history of Christianity represented by the de-Christianization effort of the French Revolution was the end, or at least the beginning of the end, of European Christianity, uh, of European Christianity, or the dominant expression of Christianity as the dominant expression of Christianity in the world. So for Mark Knoll, the French Revolution was a real turning point for him because it was a sign of de-Christianization in the Western world. As he says, it was the end, if not at least the beginning of the end, of European Christianity as the dominant expression of Christianity in the world. So European Christianity, with the French Revolution, France being the leader in that, of course, European Christianity is kind of settling down and ceasing to be the dominant form of Christianity. Um, so what happened in France was really a radical, really radical. I mean, really a breaking point in a sense. Um, so and and so it's 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 kind of sad in a way. So um, so today, if you take if you're just going back to England, for example, I I study the 19th century quite a bit, and in England in the 19th century. It's estimated probably about 65% of the population went to church in England in the 19th century. And the, a large portion of people who went to church in England in the 19th century were evangelical, people who would, who would consider themselves to be evangelicals, people who would consider themselves to be pro-revival, evangelical, and so forth. Today in England, today, so 150 years later, it's estimated that about maybe 3% of the population in England go to church. So uh, England is virtually um, a non-church going country. Um, it's amazing how, how that has so radically changed in 150 years. And that represents Western Europe. In Western Europe, the percentage of people who go to church is very, very, very low. Uh, my wife and I were just in Denmark and, in July. And Denmark is a good example, um, that Danish nation, um, a very tiny percentage of people in Denmark go to church, actually are involved in any way in Christ, church life, Christian life. Now this can be a real challenge for, uh, for the church as a kind of a missionary challenge, saying we need to reach out to these people. So church, instead of being um, kind of stifled by this, can be challenged by this, and it can be a forward movement for the church. But there's no doubt that um, what happened um, uh, in, um, in the 17th century is, and early 18th century became problematic. So, Okay, one more thing by way of introduction, and that is revival or resurgence in the church, in the history of the church, usually comes in one of two ways. So let's mention those, those one of two ways. The first way that you can get resurgence in the church, renewal in the church, actually probably it's three ways, but when you think of it. But the first way in which you can get renewal in the church is by charismatic leaders. You get the right person at the right time with the right idea. And a good example of that renewal in the church, of course, would have been Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the right person, the right time, the right idea. You get this very charismatic personality this very imaginative, creative personality reshaping the church, bringing revival and a new life to the church. So sometimes you get a kind of a revival from above, and Martin Luther is a good example of that. 
But the second way is oftentimes you get revival from below. You get revival from um, a charismatic renewal movement among the laity. Um, a charismatic renewal movement among the people of God coming together uh, and uh, bringing new life to the church. Um, and a good example of that is, um, is the charismatic movement in the church. Um, and, the and I remember I was teaching in Rhode Island at the time when a tremendous charismatic movement broke out in the Roman Catholic Church and uh, from the laity, from the people. Uh, the people wanted to bring the church alive and they got together and uh, my office mate at, at, the, at, at Barrington College where I taught before the merger, but my office mate was a, was a, um, a charismatic Anglican priest, which was very interesting. And, uh, and he used to take me to these charismatic Roman Catholic meetings and that was very interesting. I, I had never seen anything like this before. I did not grow up in that tradition. But when I saw kind of this kind of coming alive experience of the charismatic renewal movement in Rhode Island, it was really something to see. And it wasn't because they had some charismatic figure who said, we've got to change the church or bring the church alive. It's because the people of God said, we want a new understanding of what New Testament Christianity is all about. So it can come from below. Now, I suppose you could say, sometimes it comes with both of those. It comes with a charismatic leader and a laity coming alive uh, to the gospel. And you bring these two things together, and you've got an explosion. So I suppose there is maybe a third way. But usually revival comes in, that, in those kinds of ways. And we're going to see that in this, in this lecture. OK, now, just by way of, if you just look at your outline, and I'll say this by way of introduction, then we'll get to Germany. But there were three great renewal movements um, in the 17th, 18th centuries. Um, there was the German movement, which, as you see in your outline, is going to be called pietism. And here we have, we're going to be talking first about pietism. So the, 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 re, re, the movement of resurgence, the evangelical resurgence movement in Germany was called pietism. Secondly, there was the American movement that was called the awakening. And we'll talk about that separately. I mean, obviously, you can see by your outline, we're going to talk about each of these separately. So, but there was the American movement that was called awakening. And thirdly, there was the English movement, which was called the Wesleyan revival. Now, these, in a sense, are parallel movements. It's not one after the other. They're going on at the same time. They're contemporary movements. And spilling over into the 18th century and bringing life to uh, the German Lutheran Church, uh, bringing life to the Anglican Church in England uh, and in America, um, and, and bringing life to many denominations in America. OK, there's one country we aren't mentioning here in the whole outline. And of course, that is, that is France. Because France, after the French Revolution, virtually became, it, it de-Christianized itself. And um, the French government today refers to itself as a secular government. And that's why the French government today has gotten into some, some battles with people who want to wear religious symbols to work. Uh, but the French government, if you work for the French government, you can't wear religious symbols to work. Um, so they're in a bit of a battle about that. But we did not get any resurgence or renewal movement in France. OK, so first of all, introduction. Is there anything about that introductory stuff before we get to Germany, um, America, and England? OK, let's go to Germany. You've got your outline here. You can see that the outline um, gets a little long at places, so I hope it's going to be helpful to you um, here. But look at that outline. We're going to go with B, uh, Germany, and we're going to talk about pietism in Germany. OK, pietism in Germany begins with Philip Spiner. And here are his dates, the dates of Philip Spiner. Very, very important person, Philip Spiner. OK, Philip Spiner was a good Lutheran. And Philip Spiner never left the Lutheran church. He had no intention of leaving the Lutheran church. He always was a Lutheran and, 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 and intended to be a good Lutheran. So Philip Spiner, what Philip Spiner wanted to do was to bring the church alive through Reformation kind of principles. So here's the things that Philip Spiner emphasized in his ministry. Again, you know, he saw that the church had kind of flattened out, kind of become dead. 
So he feels if he emphasizes these things in his ministry, um, there's gonna, this is going to bring the church to life, and sure enough, it did. So, But I'm going to mention four things that he emphasized. Number one, in his ministry, he emphasized not just listening to the sermon, but a very practical devotional life of individuals. Number two, he emphasized spiritual transformation in the life of individuals. It's not enough to inherit, for Philip Spiner, it's not enough to inherit your faith from your father or from your grandfather or your mother or your grandmother. There has to be a true, genuine spiritual transformation in the life of every Christian, of every believer. Number three, he generally referred to this as the new birth. That was a f f kind of a familiar way of talking about spiritual transformation, to use that kind of gospel of John language, being born again. And number four, and this is going to be true of pietism in general, but number four, he emphasized the study of scripture. And not just the study of scripture because you hear the sermon, but the study of scripture with lay groups as well. So God bless you. So what he did was um, he wrote a book in 1675. I didn't put the title of the book down. I probably should. But he wrote a book in 1675. And the title of the book was Pious Longings. Pious Longings. And Pious Longings kind of became the Bible of the Pietist movement. It became what everybody, came, kind of became a bestseller. And it became a book that everybody was reading. And everybody was applying to their own life. These are people in the Lutheran church in Germany, but they're reading this, they're applying to their own life. And that book helped to launch the movement eventually that was called Pietism. Now, when that book launched Pietism, remember that these people, like Philip Spiner and the others that were mentioned, remember that these people thought of Pietism and the word pious in a good way. Pious is a good thing. It's a good term. Pietism is a good term. I know that sometimes people use the term negatively, and they probably did in that day as well. You say, oh, he sh he's so pious, or she's so pious. I think sometimes when we say that, we mean that negatively, you know? These people meant it as a term of, not as a term of derision, but as a term to embrace. So pious longings um, kind of gives you, just by the title that he chose for the book, pious longings, Gives you, um, gives you an understanding of what he was kind of all about, all, all about. Now, once he wrote his book, then the movement was launched. All right? Once the movement was launched um, and really took hold, then there are some characteristics of that movement of pietism under Spiner that were important. So let me mention the characteristics that the movement itself um, really would characterize pietism as a movement that got really launched. So, okay, number one is a, a, a central emphasis on the word of God, both preached and studied. So the Bible, you bring the Bible alive, and uh, the people are going to come alive. That was the, um, that's what pietism really believed. Bring the Bible alive, the people are going to come alive. What that meant was that the preaching had to be alive, and the Bible study had to be alive. So this, number one, is kind of a challenge to the kind of preaching that was being done in the Lutheran churches in Germany, because the preaching that was being done was dead, dry, um, not necessarily textual, um, uh, more scholastic, more philosophical. And pietism as a movement became kind of a challenge to that kind. Is that the kind of preaching we want? No. Was the we want preaching that is centered on the word of God, that brings the word of God alive to the hearts and lives of people. And then we want people studying that word in Bible studies. So that's the first characteristic, and that really did bring the Lutheran church to life. So, Okay, number two characteristic for the movement, the broader movement that, that Spiner helped to kind of launch, was the priesthood of all believers. Um, a renewal of the priesthood of all believers uh, issue that Martin Luther and John Calvin brought up. So, okay, and remember, the priesthood of all believers does not, these people are good Lutherans, so the priesthood of all believers does not mean that everybody can stand up and preach from the Bible. It doesn't mean that. Everyone doesn't have that vocation of the preacher. What it does mean is that you can be priests one to another in very, very 
wonderful, beautiful ways. You can pray for each other. People can pray for each other. Um, you don't need a priest to pray for each other. You can counsel each other. You don't need a priest to be able to counsel each other. Um, you can forgive each other your sins, of each other's sins. You don't need a priest to do that. So um, remember, priesthood of all believers should not be confused with vocation, uh, but there were these wonderful kind of priestly ways in which the people could serve each other. That's number two. Number three, and this became really, really important for pietism in general. Pietism was a beautiful marriage of the, of the head and the heart. Pietism was a beautiful kind of connectedness of the whole person, the mind of the person, the heart of the person. Um, Lutheran, Lutheranism, scholasticism, had become only a life of the mind. Um, the dogmas, the doctrines, the philosophical arguments, that's what Lutheranism had become. Pietism comes along and says, no, it's got to appeal in a sense to the whole person, the mind and the heart. Now, um, pietists were accused of just the heart, just a heart religion. These people aren't they're not concerned about the life of the mind. That was a false accusation. Pietism, the pietistic movement, the movement of pietism was a beautiful marriage of the mind and the heart. That is a false accusation that people were making that wasn't true. Um, these were people of great intellect and great hearts, warm hearts as well. So that's a, there's a beautiful kind of connection there. Number four, fourth characteristic for these people is that we are not... Um, uh, we are not going to engage in controversy. Uh, the movement of pietism said, in a sense they said, the leadership said, we do not engage in controversy. We are not about doing the um, religious battles with, our, with, the cat, with the Catholics or with other Lutherans or with other Christians. If we disagree, we disagree in love. That's all we'll do. So they, they really wanted to avoid the battles that had been going on. So that was very, very important. So, Okay, and uh, the fifth kind of characteristic is they revolutionized the training of ministers. They revolutionized how ministers were trained. Because up, what had happened in Lutheranism, in German Lutheranism, ministers were trained only academically, only intellectually. Um, they, they were trained only philosophically. But the pietistic movement said, we're going to revolutionize our training. Uh, and what we want to do is, is turn out scholars and saints. We don't want to just reproduce scholars. Um, that's not what we're all about. We want to reproduce scholars and saints. And so the training of pietism kind of represented what they believed about the marriage of the mind and the heart. Uh, of the, I'm sorry, the training of pietist ministers, training of the ministers. So they had to create their own schools. They had to create their own divinity schools, their own what today we would call seminaries, but we call them that. But they, they had to tr tra uh, create their own places for training. So that becomes really, really important here. Okay, and then number six, uh, characteristic of pietism. And that is these people really still emphasize preaching. Preaching is still very important in the pietistic tradition. So the preached word is still critical. But that word has got to be an edifying word, not just, an, not just some kind of ostentatious word, but it's got to be an edi a word of edification, a word of um, not just uh, showing the knowledge of the preacher, but a word which will reach the hearts of people and the lives of people, really touch them where they are, you know. So uh, that preaching became critical to, um, to pietism. And of course, it was first, first and foremost, it was the preaching that brought, um, brought the Lutheran church alive. So Philip Spiner, um, kind of the father of, of pietism, he's the one that got this thing going. Um, there, there again, the right person, right idea, at the right time, with the right commitment, and off you go. Um, and, the, and pietism gets kind of launched. So, Okay, any questions about Philip and about pietistic movement getting started? All right, you, you, we've seen this before, now we see it again. It's, it's almost as though these kind of founders, quote unquote, have disciples. Um, we saw that with Luther, Luther and Melanchthon. 
um, Calvin and Beza. Um, so uh, um, so we, we've seen that before, and that happened with pietism. There was a man who joined pietism named Auguste Frank. And um, he, he, um, he joined the pietist movement. He's kind of a second generation pietist. But he became a leader of that second generation. Like Spiner, he also was Lutheran. So it's very important for these people. They never intended to leave the Lutheran church. Their intention is to bring life to the Lutheran church. So like Spiner, um, this was true with August Frank. He stayed within Lutheranism, tried to bring um, Lutheranism to, um, um, you know, uh, tried to bring reform to Lutheranism. Okay, now, there were some kind of contributions that he made, and I'm going to mention three of them. Um, that he kind of, I mean, Spiner got it going. Spiner wrote his book. Spiner helps to begin work in training ministers and so forth. Um, but there were some additions, in a sense, that Frank was able to make, and I want to mention the three of those. Number one was kind of a Christianity in action uh, for Frank. Um, his, home, uh, his hometown was Leipzig in Germany, and uh, he looked around and saw that there was a need for orphanages, and so he establishes orphanages. Now, as far as he's concerned, this is in keeping with the great command of Jesus. What's the great command of Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, as far as Frank was concerned, this was loving of the neighbor. This was following the command of Jesus out of love. So that, and that became very characteristic of pietism. Um, Christianity in action, reaching out to the neighbor, especially to the poorest among us. So that becomes characteristic through Frank. Okay, second thing. He formed what he called a college of piety. A college of piety. Okay, what this college of piety was, was little cell groups of laity in the local churches meeting together every week. So the College of Piety wasn't an institution like Gordon or something like that, but it was, it was what he called the small groups. And these small groups got together, and they talked about the sermon, they studied the Bible, they sang hymns together, they, um, they, they deepened their own spiritual lives by confessing to one another and getting forgiveness and so forth. But the College of Piety was Frank's kind of invention. Um, and that was a beautiful counter, a beautiful um, balance to the preaching. So the preaching is on Sunday, and and the laity get together during the week to talk about the sermon and to build up, build their spiritual lives and so forth. College of Piety. So, okay. And thirdly, um, Frank really helped to forward the cause in a sense, or forward the doctrine of justification by faith. Justification by faith. Because justification by faith had become kind of rationalized by Lutherans as, as a doctrine that you need to believe intellectually. Frank took the doctrine of justification by faith and gave it the life that Luther wanted to give, and Luther did give to it in his day. But um, justification by faith is concerned not just with a transaction but it's concerned with the living presence of Christ in the life of the believer. So he, t he tended to take the doctrine of justification by faith and, and, had, and embedded it, in a sense, in the life of the believer. And, with the, and he talked a lot about the presence of Christ in the heart of the believer, the life of the believer. So Frank is second generation, pietist, uh, same interest that Spiner has of bringing life to the church, but adding some dimensions to it as well. So he becomes really, really important. Okay, third person that you can see is just a name I like to pronounce. So um, I wish I had a name like this. Why couldn't I have a name like this? Count L L uh, Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. I mean, there is a name, you know? Lud um, what's his first name again? Uh, Nicholas. Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. There's a name for you. So, what a great name, huh? Well, he was um, a third pietist we want to re remember. So, and you've got his dates there. So, now he had um, 
He was reared in pietism. He had relations with, uh, Spiner was actually his godfather. So, um, so there's a connection to Spiner. And Frank was his teacher. Um, Frank was the guy he learned under, learned for the ministry under Frank. So, um, so he, he was really well reared in pietism and he's gonna kind of move pietism forward, uh, stressing the kinds of things that have been stressed that we've mentioned. Okay, there is a little bit of a, uh, there's a little bit of a turn, however, with von Zinzendorf. Von, Zinder, von Zinzendorf, very charismatic person, preaching, teaching, the things of pietism, but he lived in a section called Moravia, and he gathered around him a pretty big group of followers. Now, these followers initially were pietists. They were bringing the Lutheran church to life, you know? But von Zinzendorf does break with Spiner and break with Frank in that von Zinzendorf ultimately leaves the Lutheran church. Spiner and Frank and other pietists, they're not leaving Lutheranism, they're, they're shaping Lutheranism from within. Von Zinzendorf finally decided to leave with his followers. And he called his denomination uh, the Moravians. So this is a break now. This is, this is a, it's bound to happen, it's bound to come. And now if you just think back in the course, once we started with the Roman Catholic Church in the course, we've seen a lot of Protestant groups being formed, haven't we? We've seen the Lutherans, we've seen the Anglicans, we've seen Congregationalists, we've seen lots of Baptists. Well, now we see another denomination coming out of, of this called the Moravians. Um, yeah, just. No, oh yeah, I've got, a, I've got a picture of von Zinzendorf here down at the bottom preaching in the light of Christ kind of coming upon him. This, this split was not a forced split. They weren't forced out or anything like that. I think von Zinzendorf became convinced that, um, probably a little bit convinced like Calvin, I did not leave the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church left me. Um, I did not leave the Lutheran Church. It, it left me kind of, and in order to be faithful to the light of Christ, I have to preach uh, to my people, and we have to. So I think it was very much that same kind of thing. So no one's forcing it, and it wasn't a contentious. It wasn't contentious. No one's forcing it, but he does feel it's time now. And um, so he set up his own place in Moravia as kind of the headquarters for the Moravian movement. It became a very strong missionary movement, so it, it launched out from Moravia, and, and it had an influence, pretty wide influence. It was even influence, influential on John Wesley. Um, so it had pretty, pretty broad influence. Yeah, yeah, Jesse? So with all these um, uh, leaders, and yes. the right. <laughs> No, Lutheranism is getting changed from within. It's like the Puritans changing Anglicanism from within. So uh, Lutheranism is getting changed from within. It is getting a, a, a kind of a renewal movement from within within the Lutheran within. The Lutheran. Not enough for Zinzendorf, I don't think. Probably right. Plus, he was a little bit, in a sense, geographically isolated from other large cities and that that were, were the. Pietist movement was taking hold. So, but I would say it's, yeah, I, this is not contentious. It's not, um, it's a, it's kind of a natural evolution as far as he was concerned. So, he, and he didn't see that he's breaking the Lutheran church apart or something by this. So. Yeah. I, um, we have had, it's interesting, I don't know your denominational background, but I'd love to find out the last day. But I try to remain neutral all through the course, you know. But um, I'd love to find out if you want to, on the last day, if you want to share. But um, are any of you Moravians, though? No, yeah, probably not. We have had, I think we've had two Moravian students that I know of come here to Gordon. And we had great, I had great talks with those students about their, Morav about their own denomination and about their background to the denomination and so forth. But um, I doubt if we have any Moravian students on campus. Do you know of any Moravian students on campus who identify themselves as Moravians? No. 
Well, there is that you do have these kind of you do have these kind of swings back and forth. But the Moravians have remained very, very strong missionary oriented movement. And so, um, but I'm sure there's a part of Moravianism that's very much settled down that kind of likes look, looks like the Lutheran Church before the Pietist movement began to change it, um, because that's just the way groups go. Yeah. So, but I, I haven't studied the Moravians, so I don't know, you know, where kind of where they are today. Yeah. I think the center of Moravianism is in, in in places in Pennsylvania. I think like Bethlehem and places like that. I think that's kind of the center of their life. But. Someone could look it up right now. I know some of you might be looking it up right now. Bless your hearts. But um, yeah, the Moravians. Okay, pietism. Anything about pietism at all? You know, you get, it, you get what's going on, right? The pendulum's swinging back, and the Lutheran church is becoming renewed. So that's probably the one you're least familiar with. Um, uh, probably the movement of the three that you're least familiar with. We're going to go to America, secondly, and we're going to talk about the Great Awakenings. I'm going to give an introduction first, and then we'll tell you, well, you've got your points here, but, um, but first of all, let me give an introduction to the Great Awakenings in America. There were, in America, in the, seven, in the 18th and 19th century in America, there were two or three Great Awakenings. So let me just explain that. So by Great Awakenings, I would say, you know, these are resurgence, these are evangelical resurgent movements within the church. Uh, and even within the broader society. So that's what I would mean by Great Awakenings. So, Okay, let me mention two or three. What's going on here? First of all, the first one, the date we give is 1734. And that's an important date. In American religious history, it's an important date because that's usually the date given for the, what's called the First Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening was 1800. The Second Great Awakening had both northern and southern kind of manifestations to it, which is, is a very interesting awakening, and also brought awakening within some universities like Yale and so forth. The third, but, okay, now the Third Great Awakening is in the middle of the 19th century, um, and there were revivalists like Charles Grandison Finney, F-I-N-N-E-Y, um, who led that Third Great Awakening. But the reason I'm hesitant about that is because some people say, no, there was not a Third Great Awakening. The, the revivals that are going on in the 1850s are a, are a continuation of the Second Great Awakening. So among American religious scholars, you get this kind of um, debate as to whether there were three Great Awakenings or whether there were two Great Awakenings in America. We're not interested one iota in that debate for this course. Because for this course, we're staying in the 18th century. We're doing only the first great awakening for this course. In my American Christianity course, I do the three awakenings. But for this course, we're just going to do the first great awakening and how that brought resurgence to the church, evangelical renewal to the church. So are we OK with that? So, but just so you would know, when you talk about great awakening, 1734, 1800, and about 1850, but are there two awakenings or are there three? Or do you even care? I mean, I, it's, it's, for us, it doesn't matter. Because we're focusing on the, on the first great awakening. You OK with that? OK, so look at the num number two in your outline. I want to talk about four important leaders of the First Great Awakening. So these are people bringing resurgence, renewal to the church. Um, and there were four people that were critical to the story, in a sense. OK, good. OK, the first one is probably an, oops, sorry. The first one is probably a name you are not familiar with. And his name was Theodor J. Freuligheisen. Kind of another good name to just pronounce, you know? Theodore J. Freuligheisen. You may or may not be familiar with that name, but long story short on Theodore J. Freuligheisen, um, he, Theodore J. Freuligheisen was in the Dutch Reformed Church, um, and um, he was in the Dutch Reformed Church in New Jersey. And I forget if anyone's from New Jersey. No? Any New Jersey folks here? No, I forget that. Because there's a Freuligheisen Highway in New Jersey. So the part of the country, part of New Jersey where he was from, they remember Theodore J. Freuligheisen um, with the highway and other things that they named after him. So, but he was in New Jersey, and he was Dutch Reformed. That was his denomination. 
So he was Dutch Reformed. Now, the long story short, the Dutch Reformed Church had come over from Holland and settled in the New Jersey, New York area. So, so, and that's the denomination that he belongs to. All right? So, long story short, on Theodor J. Freuligheisen, he brings renewal to his own people, to his own Dutch Reformed churches. He, he was a pretty remarkable um, kind of an um, itinerant preacher going from church to church, and he brought revival to those churches. And then, once he brought revival to the, um, to the churches in New Jersey, he also launched out to other colonies like Pennsylvania and the middle colonies, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, and places like that. He had a pretty big influence. And he also had an influence in New Jersey upon other Presbyterians. Uh, upon, other, upon Presbyterians, not other Presbyterians, he was Dutch Reformed, but he had an influence upon Presbyterians in New Jersey. So there is a story with the Presbyterians we'll talk about later. But Theodore J. Freuligheisen, so if you remember him and you look at his dates, so you kind of remember him, remember his dates, because these people that I'm talking about, these four people are all ministering kind of simultaneously with each other. So Theodore is the first one, kind of we're setting him out because he starts a bit earlier than the others. So, okay, let me mention Gilbert Tennant, and then I haven't, whoops, and then I haven't given you a, um, I haven't given you a, a five-second break yet, a Monday five-second break. So I'll do that after I mention Gilbert Tennant. You need a break today, don't you, on a Monday, a rainy Monday? I think you do. So, okay, Gilbert Tennant. There he is. Very interesting. Look at the dates of Gilbert Tennant. Okay, long story short about uh, Gilbert Tennant. Gilbert's father's name was William Tennant. There is, so there's a story to this, if you just stay with me for the story. But Gilbert's father's name was William Tennant. And William Tennant had three sons, and Gilbert was one of them. Now, the long story short here is that William Tennant was a good Presbyterian. And he reared his sons in the pres life of the Presbyterian Church. He was a good Presbyterian. He was very unhappy that the Presbyterian Church that he knew in New Jersey had pretty much settled down. It wasn't the church, the, wasn't the church alive that he had known. Uh, so the church had pretty much settled down. It wasn't what it used to be. And so he decided in uh, 1726, he decided that he was going to train his own sons for the Presbyterian ministry. Not totally out of keeping with the general way in which ministers were trained in the, in the, um, in the 18th century anyways. But he was going to train his own sons in, uh, in the Presbyterian ministry. And in 1726, he took his own sons into his home and, and getting them ready for the Presbyterian ministry. The person we're most interested, the son we're most interested in is Gilbert Tennant, his son Gilbert. Um, now, what happened was when he brought them into his home to train them for the ministry, there was a lot of derision about this, a lot of talk about this, a lot of gossip about this. And his home was derisively called the log college. That was a term of derision because he lived in a log house, obviously. So he's training his kids, his sons, to be Presbyterian ministers in the log college, kind of a derisive term. So, but he didn't mind that. I'm, I'm doing the thing I believe I should be doing, and I'm going to continue doing this. And even with other ministers, I'm going to continue doing this. Now, um, he died in, in um, 1764, so he lived long enough to have the last laugh. Because in the year 1746, his log college became Princeton University. So uh, William had the last laugh on everybody who were so derisive about his log college training Presbyterian ministers. And this is the beginning of Princeton University. So um, one of the top universities in the world, obviously. So there it is with uh, William Tennant and his, um, and his sons. All right, long story short, let's come back to Gilbert now. Gilbert was very influenced by Theodore J. Freuligheisen. Gilbert was a Presbyterian minister 
He heard Freulich Heising preach, and he was very taken with the, um, with the convictions of Theodore J. Freulich Heising. And he decided, Gilbert decided, I'm going to do the same thing with the Presbyterian churches. I'm going to go and try to bring life to the Presbyterian churches. And he does that rather successfully. So there's a whole resurgence, a whole renewal, a whole revival movement under Gilbert Tennant and Presbyterianism in New Jersey and in New York and in Pennsylvania and the Middle Colonies. So at the same time that Freulich Heising has his resurgence, Gilbert Tennant has his resurgence. They're parallel movements. So the Holy Spirit is really working to bring these churches alive, Dutch Reformed churches and Presbyterian churches with Gilbert Tennant. So, um, it's, in, it's interesting to me, uh, one of my, uh, I got a Master of Theology degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and, um, and there's a, a section of the campus of Princeton Theological Seminary, of course, is called the Tenant Campus. Um, and they're still raising money for the Tenant Campus, um, and uh, because they want to keep that name alive, um, because that's the founding of Princeton, including eventually what, what was founded as a seminary. So it was, it's kind of fascinating to see. I, I'm not a Presbyterian, so I'm kind of look, I was looking at this from the outside in a sense when I went to Princeton Seminary. But so the Gilbert Tennant or the Tennant family name is a real revered name there. So, okay, you've got a third one, but I promised you a five-second break. So um, I don't know how this does with the taping. Is it okay if I do this, Ted? If I do a five-second break, five seconds just for you to rest, stretch. Um, you know, take a break, one, two, three, four. We ended up with six true believers here today, so that's a good thing. We have only one apostate who will remain nameless, of course, um, but uh, six true believers. So I hope you're doing okay. Uh, we lecture Wednesday, lecture Friday, ne lecture next Monday and Wednesday, then we're halfway through the course. So next week we're halfway through this course. So, and then when we come back, by the way, and I'll mention this next week, I don't need to talk about that. But when we come back, I've got our scheduled for our, our sessions before the second exam then. So we'll do the same thing, two sessions before the second exam. It's going to hit us pretty quick after we get back. So, so keep on reading and studying and everything. Okay? You're, you're doing all right? You're doing okay. We can do this. All right, number three. Third on your list, no, I'm, I'm sorry, C, a C on your list, not the third on your list, C on your list is our friend George Whitfield. And there are the dates of George Whitfield, 1714 to 1770. Okay, um, now, George Whitfield, what are we going to say about George Whitfield? Uh, very fascinating. By the way, it's always W H I T E. Always get that E in there when you're writing his name. So, White. Field, but pronounced George Whitfield. Okay, where are we going to go with him? He is Anglican. He comes from a different tradition. He's not Dutch Reformed, he's not Presbyterian, and he's not even living in this country. So he comes from a different tradition. He is British Anglican. Now, George Whitfield gets the title of the Grand Itinerant. And the reason for that is because George Whitfield made um, seven trips to America. Pretty amazing. Now, we don't, we don't need to talk about this, but when you travel, you know, making seven trips to America in the 18th century, you know, you're not getting on British air and having a lovely dinner and some tea and scones and then resting and watching a movie. You are getting on a ship. It's treacherous. It's brutal. Travel in the 18th century across the ocean, it was just brutal. Um, so this is no easy task. So he was called the Grand Itinerant because making seven trips from England to these shores in the 18th century was really, 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 really hard. Now, when he came here, however, George Whitfield, even though he was an Anglican, and he used to preach in his collar and everything, robes, collar, even uh, George uh, Whitfield, when he came here, he was a revivalist that crossed denominational lines. So he preached to the whosoever. Um, he preached both to the converted and the unconverted. So he was the greatest revivalist in terms of reaching people from Maine to Georgia uh, during his seven trips over here, this grand itinerant. So he was pretty <clears throat> he was pretty remarkable person, no doubt about that. So 
he brought great revival, but a great revival that crossed denominational lines. Um, he was very interested in his preaching style because I always contrast him to, to uh, Jonathan Edwards, and we'll talk about Jonathan Edwards next. Jo George Whitfield was a fascinating person. He was one of those kind of revival from above people, the charismatic leader, you know. And um, he was he he preached he preached often in the open air. He didn't need he didn't need churches to preach in or buildings to preach in. Often preached in the open air, out in the streets, around in the village greens, out in the Boston Common. He used to preach, and um, and uh, he and he didn't he wasn't um, he wasn't a he was a very um, charismatic preacher, very dramatic kind of preacher. And nothing, uh, nothing stopped him from preaching. I got a couple of pictures. Here's one of George preaching in the open air. And um, there, a very typical picture of George preaching. And there he is in his collar and his robes and so forth in the open air. Here's another one. I love this picture of George preaching because nothing, nothing bothered him. And so here he's preaching in a place like Boston Common. And people are, people are blowing horns and beating drums. And some people are convicted and fainting at his feet. Some, this guy up on the tree is blowing a trumpet at him to stop his preaching. But that didn't bother George because he just kind of continued preaching. So, and he, he, um, he often preached in the open air. It is said that, um, like in the Boston Common, it is said that uh, as many as eight to 10,000 people could hear him preach when he preached. Now this is before we don't have microphones and speakers and everything. Um, but um, it is said that up to 10,000 people could hear him preach. In fact, long story short, in, when he was in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin, who was a friend of George Whitfield, Benjamin Franklin circled the crowds. And Benjamin Franklin estimated that, that day that Benjamin Franklin was doing his kind of scientific investigation. He circled the crowds and estimated there were about 10,000 hearing George Whitfield preach. So George Whitfield standing up you know, somewhere. Um, to preach, there he is. There's George preaching away here, um, and I have. Uh, this is a long story short. That makes uh, I don't try to make any connection of this whatsoever, but um, I have actually seen in a museum the field pulpit of George Whitfield because he didn't always preach on high hills or stumps or um, he often he had a field pulpit, and this field pulpit he. Um, it, it, it all collapsed, and all, he invented this. And then when he took it out, when he was preaching in the fields or in the town squares, he would open up this pulpit. Then he had, it had a couple stairs. Then it had a pulpit that went on here so he could have see all the people. And that was his pulpit for his preaching. And then he, he, when he was done, he just, it all collapses and folds down and goes in neat, and off you go you know, to your next preaching engagement. But pretty amazing. In fact, um, Ted and I would know that near the home of Steve Hunt and his wife and family. There is a place that marks a place where George Whitfield preached. I think it's actually in the Ipswich line or is it in the Raleigh line? I forget if it's in the Ipswich. It's right at the line between Ipswich and Raleigh. And Steve took me one day. I was thrilled to see. Have you seen that? I was thrilled to see that. The place where George Whitfield preached on a big rock. And there, you know, there's, there's a um, good historical record for George Whitfield preaching, right? right just up the pike from us. So um, pretty amazing. So uh, George Whitfield, he was a remarkable guy. OK, here's a quick question before we go. Where is George Whitfield buried? Where is he buried? Take a guess. Just take a wild guess. Go, take a guess. England, that's a good guess. Anybody else want to take a guess? Where is George Whitfield buried? He's buried in Newburyport, Massachusetts, about 10 miles from here or so. Um, because George was here on his seventh preaching campaign. He was up in Maine preaching. He got sick. They brought him down, put him in a parsonage in New Hampshire. And uh, he was up in New Hampshire preaching. Brought him down to Massachusetts, put him in the parsonage next to a church that he had helped to found. And he died in the parsonage. And by his wishes then, he wished to be buried under the pulpit. He's still there. So if you go into, this is a Presbyterian church in Newburyport. So if you go into the Presbyterian church in Newburyport, in the back of the church, you're going to find there's lots of things about George Whitfield. And then if you ask the preacher, maybe he'll take you down and show you George Whitfield's grave underneath the pulpit of the church. So George, bless him. He's not very far from here. So, um, so I should, for my American Christianity course, I should do that as a field trip. I haven't done that yet. But. George Whitfield, the grand itinerant. 
same time as the Dutch Reformed Presbyterians, he's bringing a revival to all kinds of people in America. So he's the third. Okay, have a great day. And we'll lecture on it. We'll just keep going on Wednesday and Friday this week. So. This is Dr. Roger Green in his church history course, Reformation to the Present. This is session number 12 on pietism in Germany and America.